Hello, good day, and welcome to Doc Talk. Thank you for listening. Today is all about crucial accountability. Views expressed here are our own and do not reflect the views of any past or present employers. This is intellectual property of Dr. Busey, Revolutionary Healthcare PLLC. Nothing that we're saying today reflects upon the U.S. Army Department of Defense and yada, yada, yada. For new listeners, the purpose of this podcast is to explore and understand perspectives and, whenever possible, help one another out. Welcome to Doc Talk. Today's topic is crucial accountability. I'm joined by Larry Plaxco and Kevin Herms. Larry, introduce yourself. All right. Good. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Uh, Larry Plaxco. I'm a major in the uh, United States Army and the healthcare. Uh, I spent most of my career dealing with traumatic brain injury within the DoD. I think applicable to this podcast is the last four years, especially since 2014, as far back as that, I've been part of, of healthcare planning, especially with something called the Defense Health Agency, and how the uh, AMED or the um, military. Uh, Army military uh, uh, medical side of things is going into a more congressional and center uh, control. Um, the last three years I've spent transferring a whole hospital into this uh, this bigger agency. So when we um, hop on today's topic, I've got a lot of different levels of managerial experience with the various types of healthcare and how far and up uh, down uh, some of these standards go, if you will. So that's me in a nutshell, and I'm trying to crack out that nutshell. Uh, so my name is Kevin Hermes, and I have been in the military for 15 years now. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in healthcare administration, uh, working on my master's in healthcare administration. Um, I've really seen uh, every aspect of military medicine from the very front line to the surgical teams, to uh, inside the clinics, um, and currently working in a uh, department level uh, leadership position. Uh, so a lot of the, a lot of the discussions I think we're going to have about accountability really deals with the um, healthcare administrator side and the roles that we play and the roles that we play and the roles that we uh, try to enforce on people. Um, so I think. Having uh, my perspective into this with uh, two providers is just a good aspect um, uh, from what I see from my foxhole as well. Awesome. I, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Actually, you guys were one of my first people I thought of when I was like, hey, we should do a podcast. So um, I've, I've seen you guys at work. I know you both hold people accountable for expectations uh, for projects that they promise to do. And um it's going to be, it's going to be a fun conversation. Yeah. For the listener out there. Yeah. We all had a big role together for multiple years. Um, shoot. It's been like five years ago, hasn't it? <laughs> so we all have that experience of relying on each other, taking in uh, the various viewpoints and trying to get the best medical and administrative situations uh, through listening to each other. So we're used to a, a team among us, even though we, there's been disagreements in the past. So this should be, you know, this should be fun. Totally agree. So uh, I know that both of you are part of a highly accountable organization and, uh, you know, that's a nebulous term. So um, number one, did you guys read the blog? I don't expect you to. I've read the blog. (laughs) Um, And to keep up with this, this high reliability uh, situation, like this is something that, uh, I mean, you remember when we were at say Fort Bliss together, this is something the military has been preaching in their healthcare for years. I mean, all the way back to the story of Sully landing the, the plane in the river um, and putting that, you know, montage to what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase our reliability and um, get some of our statistics that have been generally embarrassing in the public eye, <laughs> like when the New York Times reports on you, uh, back to normal standards. So, yeah, um, I'm ready to talk. Okay, so let's start then. Um, what are the effects of low accountability? So with uh, low accountability... You end up with uh, staff members doing really whatever they want. Um, If they are not held accountable, if they are allowed to operate um, without rules, without restrictions or uh, influence, then they're going to do the least possible for, I would say, 75% of the workforce. Um, You do have those people who are always going to do 
uh, the right thing all the time. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. But I would almost say human nature for a lot of people says if they can get away with it, they're going to do it. I think that's a big point, too. So I know that we're all kind of type A. We, we want to do the best for uh, our patients or the people that we serve. Um, let's talk about that 75%. So how do you hold a group that may not want to do more accountable and not necessarily like hold them to it? Because how do, how do you encourage people to do things they don't want to do? So I would honestly say the number one thing you can do is having presence. Um, if you were there and people know that you're there and know that you know what you're talking about, um, they're more likely to work um, for you, uh, kind of follow the same path that you're looking for if they know somebody's there to uh, hold them accountable versus sitting in an office, uh, being tucked away in a back corner um, and not being around. That sounds very similar to somebody I work with right now, but I'm going to open it up to Larry right now. That's where we get to some of this. Kevin's uh, a thought about getting out of the office, just being seen. People do better when there's friendships, when there's a team, when there's a, a different group dynamic. And in an organization as big as probably all of ours, <laughs> the DOD, uh, you tend to get lost in the mix, which is part of the hard, the, the hard, it's part of the hard part of keeping people accountable is you're just one little speck of sand in the sea. How do you get that one speck of sand up to the standard of everyone else? And it's creating a team-like environment where by your very nature, you're driven to match those around you. Um, personally, the way I try to run my clinics is I try to be seen if there is something that's just really, can I say shitty, <laughs> that's happening, I try to be the first one to step into it so they know I'm not afraid to get my feet wet as well. Ah, oh, this, you know, this task is going to suck. All right, here's my plan of how I'm going to go about it first. Who's with me and who wants to getting those decisions, those decisions <laughs> from those folks that work with you and getting them ownership of the task. That is what brings that that low level accountability at the minor managerial level up to bringing a standard that you want to work with. And then you can talk about higher forms of accountability afterwards. Um, I could apply that later to just our credentialing and what we expect our providers to do. If we can get everyone on the same level of a similar credentialing, hey, our scope of practice is right here. You're going to have folks that don't want to rise to that scope. They want to perform the bare minimum. But if you get the whole team up and running, then it's easier to, say, impress someone's credentials and get them to practice where they should be. Um, so that's the macro level, if you will, while the minor level is, yeah, we've got a task of 300 people coming through the knee COVID test. It's going to suck. We're getting there at 5 a.m. I'm there. I volunteered. Who wants to come with me? That's the low level of leading the charge. So it's a mix of leadership being seen and not making it all about being accountable, but raising these standards and getting that group think we're all in this together. It's not you. It's not me. It's us. And that's that's the big point. And honestly, that's a huge point. So I recently um, took on a role as a clinical, uh, the clinic medical director. And one of the first things I did, and everybody was asking why I did it, was I actually came up with a vision and a mission that we all agreed on. Like I went to every level and I'm like, why did you choose to work here? What are the values you want to see here? Why do you stay here? We went through this with every employee. Now, like you're wasting your time because that's that's not a good use of medical time but already it's turning things in a direction that hadn't gone in three years and i have a great boss it's just he's spread across like 15 different hats at this point so he can't be on that ground level we have to have somebody at the ground level working it and that in some ways that's half of our issue is we do have several folks that may not be in those leadership uh, levels that really do want to reach out and expand access or expand uh, uh, certain things that would be beneficial to the whole group, but they don't have that outlet of, yes, I give you authority to do that. And that's been kind of something that's held us back. So at my level, anytime I've got someone, Hey, it's a great idea. Can I, would you like to do that? And I go, I don't have time myself to do it, but I fully will give you all the authority to do this that I can give you. Would you like to take that? I'll help you in any way I can. And they're like, I've never been told I have the ability to do this and to affect this. And it's getting those key players up there, which then in turn uh, gets them in places where they can be promoted or other additional factors. So just supporting your staff in those ways 
it does increase that whole accountability and again the whole standards of that organization. Kevin, what do you think? Uh, I also think all too often we put people in leadership positions um, just because they're there versus they they should be there. Um, and then the other thing that I've seen a lot of is those that are in the leadership positions that do want to make the changes, the, the decisions are made two, three, two or three levels above them uh, that is preventing them from actually making a true difference. They are basically being told, here's what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And there's so little wiggle room that those leadership positions are almost just there as a uh, somebody to scold somebody to hold accountable when things go poorly, but not when things are going well. So that's, that's awesome because uh, I've had this conversation with my boss a few times and I know he's been super frustrated. Uh, currently he has a lot of responsibility without authority to do anything about it. And as such, you, you basically paint a target on your back. I actually joked with my wife about getting uh, a target tattooed on my back and she she nicks that really quick i had a thought and it just went that way <laughs> i was like I've, you know as we get going there's some examples from dha that we can make pretty clear but we don't want to act like we're dissing dha while we're talking about this stuff <laughs> to it no i mean so, some of these organizations are so intensely um, complex and they don't necessarily need to be but that's just the way it is um and you have to work within that that structure or lack thereof uh, to hopefully affect meaningful and positive change. Yep. Kind of going off what Kevin uh, just said at those higher levels. Here, the thought came back here. So at those higher levels that Kevin referred to, uh, one of the things that I do, there's a small uh, corporate management uh, seminar called the Arbinger Group. Um, it was kind of created uh, along uh, uh, Steve, Stephen Covey's lines of leadership and some of those thoughts, a uh, completely separate element. And we've been kind of pulling some of these uh, tasks I into our, our clinics to try to, to reach. And one of the key things that, that, that hit me so well is, again, empowering your folks from those upper levels and even those upper levels letting themselves be held accountable. And it's not even like we're giving power to each other. Again, it's getting back into the group think of we're all in this together and how can we all affect the, the mission, if you will. Um, he gave an example of one of the new leaders of Ford. Ford was completely trashed. Government was trying to bail them out. Nothing was working. They hired a new CEO. And the first thing he did was walk in and go, I'm in charge. <laughs> and everyone went to go to this meeting and like, well, so uh, here's my slides. Here's it. And everything was green. <laughs> on every slide every production slide everything sales everything was green and he's like guys uh nothing's green we're, we're literally in the hole like i'm new here and he said it was week after week we're green we're green we're green and goes finally someone let red pop on their slide and it was some guy in production like hey this part that we're supposed to get from this area they're short uh supplies we're not able to make it i'm not gonna meet my production run i'm absolutely red and he said, all he did was just clap. That's real. That's what I'm looking for. That's what we need to hear. And he was proud to hear it. I'm going to go back. How many times have you brought an issue to your boss that may need to be addressed? And it's something for me, it's usually at a minor level. We need to address it right away. So it doesn't become a major level thing, just something to address that I can't personally address. You know, I could get involved in a situation, but it's kind of outside my realm. And if it's a people per, uh, situation, it may be something that I say, and it can continue a, a, a fight, if you will, but from a next level up, Hey guys, we're just trying to get together. Uh, can we fix this this way? Just one little quote from the boss above, you can fix it because he has that authority, if you will. Well, that's kind of what happened in this case. These slides were read and within 10 seconds around the table after he clapped, it was, Hey, Bob, I had that uh, same issue of a part that we were in production last year. Uh, I'll make a call and see if I can get our, our guys. Oh, no, I, I know the other one over there in China that's working on the same uh, type of electronics. Let me make a call. Within like 20 seconds, the folks around the table were able to help the guy fix it without any additional cost, factor, anything at all. And the CEO never had to get involved. He said after about two, three weeks of that, uh, the slide went to Amber. 
And then two, three weeks later, went back to green, all good on that element. And when the rest of the folks saw that, the next week, the slides were a rainbow of green, reds, ambers, because folks knew it was safe to report the issues. And that's the point I'm trying to drive home is at that higher level of accountability, how free are you to actually talk about the issues, especially the stuff that's showstopper, or as I stated earlier, the stuff that's not showstopper, but it might be in two to three months. We have to um, involve all of that before it becomes a, a major headache and a, a game changer, a game stopper to our, to our uh, productivity. So this is great. It's like you actually read the book. Thank you. Uh, so specifically like content, what's the problem? Is it the content? Is the patterns of behavior or is it the relationships? And we're getting into that granularity of the relationships or that ground level. The, uh, the patterns are the behavioral level, things that we might have to do an individual development plan for, and then the content. So again, we need to have that good data coming in and the feedback from that, from every level to make sure that we, that we don't uh, find ourselves surrounded by yes men who don't have the mission at heart. They are, are allowing us to blindly walk into darkness. Yeah, to make that a little realistic, one of our, well, you remember, one of our biggest areas of how we figure out our RVUs per provider um, in our system is something that we call Dimmer's Eye. I can't remember the acronym for the life of me, but it's basically our payroll system where you put in how many hours you've worked and put it with uh, your productivity and it gives you your RVUs at the end of the day. When I first uh, started working this facility, it was don't let anyone know you're working more than eight hours a day. Plug that in. And it didn't matter. I could have worked 10, 12 hours on some shifts because of what we were doing. And it was still eight hours, but it showed I did all the years of data. The bean counters then told us, you should be doing this much productivity in eight hours. And we want you to actually do your time cards honestly now. You know, a salaried folks didn't really matter what we put in, but now I'm putting in my 10, 11 hours. Wow, your productivity slipped. Yeah, now we're actually giving you the real stuff. But the comparison was the higher levels who never saw how we ran the clinic, then looked at this productivity, said we should be meeting a certain goal, which we weren't because uh, now we're actually doing things honestly, but they had over a decade's worth of data that showed we should be doing a certain amount. So they would not change to match what we could do. And that's kind of where our next five to 10 year plans have come from is how much productivity one individual should have when it never was reported accurately. So again, different levels of accountability in the organizations make a huge difference into how much money, uh, how much uh, patients are actually allowed, uh, how much you're impaneled and what you can actually address. And that's kind of where we're at today. I think a lot of that goes to uh, being a uh, data guy myself. Um, you can make data look any way you want it. Um, I can show the same slide. I can show the same data three different ways, depending on what need, what the intent is. Um, and until people use data correctly and truly paint a real picture, then we're going to continue to have um, exactly what you're saying um, with, hey, we're just going to show this and then it's going to come back and bite us in the long run. This is where uh, I kind of threw that out there to get the, the conversation open. I was blessed to have a individual running our, our hospital who when say the big bean counters from this <laughs> giant organization above us, came down and said, you're doing everything wrong and you should be doing this based on uh, all these RVUs. We've already pre-calculated all this workload. He said, oh, uh, we were putting it in wrong for years. So everything you've got is wrong. The guy goes, no, numbers don't lie. He goes, well, if we gave you bad data, your numbers are, are, are dead. Well, I need you to address and drop everything. And the guy goes, no, because that will completely hinder the way I do business at this hospital. So I can't do that. Can we talk about a different method? And having just that leader that's literally all he said the whole meeting. The rest of us was reporting just that leader going, nope, um, these guys are doing the right thing. It really emboldened the rest of us to know, hey, we're taken care of and I can uh, do my care well. I can take care of my patient load well without uh, negatively affecting us. And that was just one little phrase from one little leader over a course of about 30 seconds that I just described. So again, I, I, as we go back to the leadership accountability, those above us, assisting out like just those little things mean everything 
And that's, that's wonderful. So uh, what you described were a couple of really good points. So when we talk about data and the the decisions we make off of it, crap in, crap out, right? Like if, if it's terrible data going in, you're going to make bad decisions. So there has to be a validation of the information you're getting. And that's not just strictly data. That's also the the real conversations you have with your employees, your, your coworkers, your team, um, because again, if, if you're the type of leader that doesn't want to take that feedback, no one's going to give you that feedback and you're going to find yourself kind of up shit's Creek with no one supporting you. Oh, and vice versa, the couple of folks that listen to the bad data, um, end up being short by almost 60% in some areas of their clinics, uh, staff from folks answering the phones, uh, front desk staff, nurses, uh, all over because they listen to that bad data. And now, uh, at least in our government world, a hire can take six to eight to nine months, depending on how the, the process rolls. So you're looking at a year of bad care, if you will, a year of, of, of bad staffing that you now have to deal with because we weren't able to predict or even listen to our folks when they said, hey, you think that person's extra? It's not. Here's their active role. So kind of reversing that back then how do we take a productive clinic or productive organization move it to where we talked about those top 25 percent that are doing awesome work and then those bottom 70 percent if you will that just barely coast how do you take care of that then 70 percent when you may have this bad data telling you what your staffing model is and you have seniority you have <laughs> tenure if you will on some ends how do you get that others that don't want to play well? How do you get that to interact with the rest? That's kind of the question that, you know, it would, I solved all the other stuff. Now what's left? So I would argue, or I, I don't want to, it's not an argument. It is, uh, there's so much proven um, history behind it that yearly evaluations are a terrible concept. Um, giving real time feedback um, when it happens or as it's going along, and then at the conclusion of a set time period, set more buy-in from your employees. You get more buy-in from the staff and people around you. Um, so understanding what gets people to be motivated uh, is huge when it comes to uh, reliability um, when it comes to productivity uh, and everything along those lines. And to chime in here, I know for me, one of the demotivators is seeing the guy that's done nothing or is actively going against policies, uh, seeing them get away with it. And then you're sitting here going, God, I've done so much and I'm getting counseled for my bad attitude. Uh, like, because... I feel like no one gives a damn if I do good for the patient, does do bad for the patient, if my nurse or my CMA doesn't help me do the mission. Like, it, it's demotivating to see people not being held accountable uh, and having those crucial conversations uh, to improve. Pr improve. That's where I agree. With, uh, it's those conversations at the, the micro level. Um, try to get this thought out, but when you have those low performers, you ha often have to ask them, what do you want to get out of this? What do you want to get out of this job? What is your goal for being here? And I hate to put it this way, but I did have one folk in my past that said, it's just to get a paycheck. Fantastic. I now know your motivation. If we can have an honest uh, uh, discussion, at least we can create something. That's where that whole uh, bonding through through a, a common ground is whenever you have something that needs to be decided, getting their input and even trying to maybe not directly give them that responsibility, but get their buy-in on it. Hey, we're doing this thing. We're changing this process. What do you see from your level? And even if I you know, don't even like their advice they gave, just being there to hear it is something they usually have never had done before. <laughs> it's how do we slowly incorporate them into part of the team um, it's not going to go so well for everyone, but that is the smallest role that I found that I could personally affect. And just seeing, say, my team that I've been a part of uh, now for just a little over a year, I've seen some folks that were not active parts of the team that have slowly bought in. And even though they're not major team members, 
I can count on about 20% buy-in, which has improved my whole team. So my 60, 70% performer that's doing that much work for certain tasks can now only do 40 to 50%. It prevents them from burnout. Um, and we now can act better as a, as a whole unit, a cohesive unit. So I think you hit on something that is so important, um, especially uh, for my foxhole, at least, is we're not asking leaders to be friends with everyone, um, but we do need leaders to be engaged. We need leaders to know the people that they are working with that are uh, right there beside them. And in order, by having that knowledge, understanding what makes them tick, that's how you get people to perform at their optimal level. Because uh, no one, no two people are the same. Um, understanding what, what makes you tick Blake and what makes you tick Larry, uh, very different. But as a leader, I need to know this to get you to work at your highest uh, potential and to get what our ultimate goal is out. You do find that many of these, uh, like I mean, Kevin nailed it, many of these folks uh, in, in many situations, especially again in organizations as big as ours, have never once really heard their voice heard. I mean, you always have that troublemaker whose voice will never be shut up, <laughs> but the ones that may be underperforming, uh, it's, it's just being able to voice a concern to someone they know listened. Um, I'm going to go a little like uh, kind of that military, like false motivation here. But a general told me at a promotion ceremony of mine, <laughs> the greatest quality I've ever seen in a leader is just walking around. How many leaders, again, as you see back in their office and how many do you see even just walking through and saying hi. And I've noticed that the folks that we follow the most that have done the most positive impact on organizations are the ones that once or twice a week will just poke their head in. Hey, I was just walking by. You guys need anything. It's a 10 second conversation, but those one or two micro things that I mentioned earlier that could turn into macro things later. Hey, this just popped up. I'm just letting you know. Fantastic. Let me know how that goes. And that little just, you know, elbow rubbing in the hallway is what makes the whole difference on how bad situations have good outcomes or bad situations, or let me put it this way. Uncomfortable situations never become bad situations. Well, with that, I, I think we've hit on so many good topics and I really enjoyed our conversation. Are there any other things that we didn't talk about that um, you guys wanted to get off your chest or vent about or anything like that regarding uh, this topic? Yeah, I'll go off of you. You kind of brought up on the blog, a, you know, situation where you start a job you're kind of promised the world and when you get there it's just how do you get all the external factors the administration the purchasing departments the say educational <laughs> abilities that don't even want to cross talk with each other let alone you how do you get started and how does that affect you and and, and your career how does that it's it's such a <laughs> unique thing and hopefully you can hear this the, the sarcasm on that it's so hard to address and and the situations that we've encountered so we'll throw this out there the again we as a military have been taken over by a defense health agency and when COVID-19 hit it really rocked the whole world not just uh, you know us but with our job it's to keep up the national defense to keep the health of the force I mean things that you cannot let go uh, especially regardless of political happenings in the real world where uh, we saw how COVID just tore through our political and social uh, political spectrum. Um, we can't even afford that because if the national defense falls, we have failed our mission. So we went, how can we affect this the best? And uh, something that's now kind of infamous, our joint chiefs, every major general wrote a letter to the secretary of defense and said, this giant organization that just took over this defense health agency has caused us to fail our COVID mission had it not been for what our, what our legacy systems were to carry on that were not yet under their control. So we saw that instantly that the only way we could react properly to helping cities that were completely flooded with uh, uh, COVID cases where wards were completely booked, um, 
places like Houston, Texas, if you will, we had to send out field hospitals. And the only way we were able to do that was this were groups that did not fall under uh, that accountability. Yet we have a turn a year later, the only way we were able to get our vaccines out so fast were because we had that giant organization, the DHA, that then had all the contacts politically that were able to grasp and get the, the vaccines out to where they needed to be and distribute them to the whole force, not just what the, say, the army sees. So you've got this whole, you know, was it good? Was it bad? Well, at the beginning, it was terrible. It did not help us. Was it good at the end? Yes, it's, it's really helped change everything. And how do we bond those two together? So while that story doesn't really give an answer to the questions I've asked, it's how do we get the legacy or how do we get a new provider promise the world and all those organizations to crosstalk. And sometimes you're just that one grain of sand on the beach. Sometimes you can actually affect one of the waves that affects the rest of the sand. Where do you go? And I think we hit that a little bit earlier is hitting those leadership levels that are willing just to stand by you and say, he's right is the first step. So. Yeah. From my personal point of view, my, my current boss, uh, he's been an advocate for the, things that we've been trying to do. Um, we have conversations regarding goals, objectives, missions, um, like at length. Um, I wish I had more time with him because he, he has a, a perspective that I, I'm not good at yet. Um, so bonding, the bonding part is between the political side. So winning hearts and minds, um, getting that political capital to change a system um, not pissing off everyone along the way. Like that was one of those learning points that I had to get over because just pointing out that what you're doing is completely um, against all guidelines, against any reason that's all based on feels saying that to people doesn't win anybody over. So my, my boss has that capability, but I worry that some of that is too far. So like if you're always trying to please people so that they'll agree with you later, and you don't hold them accountable now, then people walk all over you. So we're running into that now. Uh, so I think there's a there's a bonding between the political, but also the execution and then the end mission. And that's that's the dynamic of a leader. And it's a forever struggle, right? It's a, not even a struggle, it's a forever learning case. So right now I'm, I'm repairing all the things or trying to repair all the things that that I broke along the way because no one was listening. So my strategy was, well, if no one listens, at least I can point it out in a very, very clear way that this is not the way to go. And uh, as a result made some, hopefully not enemies, but people that like worried that I wasn't for the team, but now things are starting to change where they're like, Oh, this guy actually wants to help us be better. And I, I now I'm starting to build the political capital, but you know, that's three years in, that's a long time. So the, the struggle is real. It's just a constant conversation. It's a constant, like working the problem and hopefully making progress. Um, but culture takes a long time to change up to 10 years in the literature. And I, I would argue that it may be longer, uh, without like punctuated equilibrium. I feel like what's helped me best with what you just said, and I feel like a rat in a wheel sometimes, <laughs> but uh, my last re review from my boss it actually said, excellent long range planner. I never considered myself as that. Like my goal, it's, <laughs> I, it sounds like I might have some wisdom here, but my goal I've told my staff is, you know, we can do a lot of stuff here, but my goal is to see patients, uh, affect the the jobs that I've been put in and then go home like that like I'm tired <laughs> and when we talk that's it like I'm not trying to enforce and jump all over and be all this high speed let's go it's here's the job we're going to get done this week we get it done we go home like it keeping it at a very basic if you will low minimal expectation where they go oh that's his expectation but then every time I have a staff meeting, uh, we do have, a, a, with, with my clinic, we don't do so much daily huddles as we do, like uh, maybe once or twice a week, the, uh, just the way we act at the huddle. Hey, remember, this week is this thing, and we're going to try to do this other thing for next week. 
And then when I brief other, other items, it's, we have this thing coming up next month. And then I've got two providers on leave in two months. And they're like, wow. I'm like, just having literally an iPhone with a calendar to review and remind folks, this is what's coming up. It does kind of keep the thought off of some of this political stuff, this maybe personnel discussions. And it's, wow, that guy is really thinking about the future. No, I just want to go home and not do anything last minute and react to it. And just having the staffing and even my boss above me, wow, he's paying attention. <laughs> it really does change how you're perceived in an organization and that you're just trying to help people. And like I gave with the, uh, the example earlier from the four guy, hey, I've got this thing coming up next month. And another guy on the other end of the table from a completely different uh, part of the organization. Hey, I actually have documents on that. Would you like me to forward you an example? Fantastic. That is 80% of the work done just off of that one conversation. So I hope that helps out. That's the, just the little piece that I do is keeping a calendar, demonstrating one week, two weeks, one month, and two months out. Um, I try to keep 90 days in my calendar, but I honestly don't focus on it that well. But the perception is that I do. And when the perception is, you know what you're doing, you do get other folks that want to help. And also it's kind of that when you rise up, some people want to latch on and rise up with you and they're willing to assist so they can uh, uh, reach out and affect the change they want to affect. So it's kind of that whole conversation we've been having. Essentially be the leader, right? Be the leader that you'd want. Yeah, and, and don't be afraid to talk to friends when it doesn't you know, go your way. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, guys, uh, this has been the greatest bromance in uh, history. I, I miss you guys immensely. And uh, I hope we get to do this again um, on separate topics. And honestly, the whole goal of this is to reconnect, um, to stop burnout, to learn from each other. So again, thank you for your perspectives. Oh, you're not going to let Kevin recap his last thoughts? <laughs> Um, no, I was going to say uh, it, the important, some of the important stuff is realistic goals and expectations um, kind of hitting towards what Larry was saying. If you have realistic goals and expectations and the people around you know what the realistic goals and expectations are, you're not trying to jump through hoops to accomplish um, what needs to be done. All too often uh, we see it on our side with people coming in, uh, new people coming in and they want to turn things their way. Uh, they need to put it, put their spin on whatever uh, versus looking to see what is going on um, and looking to see what works well and how, how they can improve. It's that sitting back and observing for a good 30 days. Um, and unless if it's something that, is life limb or eyesight or it's putting somebody in danger let it play out for a little bit let's let see what's going on and then maybe you need to adjust how you look at things versus how you want to push it on them so i think that's very important um and i'm a huge huge believer that it, unless if it is critical um towards a patient towards uh, a true mission or goal, it can wait till tomorrow. Um, if it is something that you have to send an email out and it's not something that you come down and see me or you I come see you or on something, it can likely wait till tomorrow and just go from there. It helps boost morale. It helps boost uh, those around you. So uh, just the people having people's backs around you um, really helps get the buy-in that we've been talking about the whole time. Absolutely. Agreed. Well, Dr. Busey, I appreciate you inviting us in today. The, this has been fun and I look forward to uh, the future conversations. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll get to do one of these in person some year. I want to thank our guests today. They were amazing. This topic is amazingly important to everyone that listens. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And remember, the whole purpose of this podcast is to learn from each other, enjoy new perspectives, and to help each other out.